and record it to the cloud. <laughs> right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the drill. Um, I know my name says Brandy Caldwell, but I am not Brandy Caldwell. She, <laughs> she couldn't be with us and helping us today. So I'm Tina Benson, and I'm one of the NBCT ambassadors. And welcome to our drill on, and I had wrote down, I totally forgot it. <laughs> basic training, getting started. I'm sorry. Oh, basic, yeah, I got it right. Overview of the process. I need to get better glasses to read a little print. Now, um, I'm with Michelle Thomason and JC Douglas, and they are going to be presenting today. I'll be monitoring the chat and helping them answer any questions you have. And we want this to be engaging and informative. Um, so go ahead and keep muted. But if you have any questions, um, just put it in the chat box or um, unmute yourself um, when one of them prompts you or um, Maybe we'll have some question time at the end. We'll, we'll have to see. I know a lot of you probably will have a lot of questions about getting started. We are recording the um, session so that you can look at it again. And also, if you saw the email yesterday from um, Dr. Shields about Atlas and you haven't clicked it open yet, um, go ahead and do so because I think there's a time limit on it. But she gave everyone yesterday um, access to Atlas so that you can watch um, videos and look at materials. And if you haven't been introduced to Atlas yet, it is a wonderful tool. So you now have access to it and can use it and things. So um, housekeeping, I've got the attendance form up there. Click it so that you get your attendance for today. Yesterday, I realized about, you know, after three o'clock, oh my gosh, I hadn't done it today. So I got mine. Make sure you get yours really early. Also, if you haven't registered on PowerSchool, um, I put that link up there. I also put a few, I'll also have a few other links I'll put up in there um, throughout the day or throughout the session. We're not here all day on this, but I am going to turn it over to JC and let her get started. One second, I had a little issue with <laughs> this there. Of course, my Zoom has been giving me crazy fits today. Let's see. All right. So can you guys see my screen now or no? It's not showing. It's not showing? No. Okay. One second. Let's try that again. So we still have people coming in. Of course, I this would happen to me. Okay, now does that look like? Is it working now? It's working. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, we couldn't get started without a little bit of technical difficulty. <laughs> Of course not. Yeah. So um, we're really glad that all of you are here today for basic training for becoming a phenomenal Alabama MBCT. And we hope that this will be a really informative session for everyone. Um, we're just going to kind of do an overview of, you know, a lot of just the basic information that you'll need to get started. And then there are some other sessions that you can go to later and you can watch some of the recorded sessions about the particular components. Um, this is just kind of a, like I said, an overview of the entire process. So um, we'll go ahead and get our objectives for the day. It's our mission objectives. So the first thing that we want to make sure that everyone does today is understand what the MBCT process is and why it matters. We're gonna help you to understand the steps in the process. We're going to show you how to find resources where you can look for help and then help you to consider a plan of attack for getting started with the MBCT process. So those are our objectives and goals for the day. Uh, my name is JC Douglas. I certified in 2020 in literacy, um, ELA, early and middle childhood. I teach in Coleman County at Parkside School, which is a kindergarten through eighth grade. I teach middle school uh, ELA. And next year I'll be teaching middle school science. And Michelle, if you wanna introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. 
my name is Michelle Thomason. I am um, NBCT uh, certified in 2019 with my early childhood generalist. And for this upcoming school year, I will be assistant principal um, for kindergarten through third grade at West Miss Station, which is Lee County Schools. Um, and I'm excited to be here and to see you guys. Okay, the first thing that we're going to do is just a little activity. Um, if you have another device and you want to scan the QR code, um, or there's also a link there at the bottom of that screen, it says, when you think of accomplished teacher, what four words come to mind? So when you hear the phrase accomplished teacher or accomplished teaching, what, what are some words that you think of? And uh, Tina, you may need to put that link in the chat if it's not okay. already there. I'm not sure if they can do it. It's not letting me capture it on my end. Is it not? Let me see if I can put it there. Yeah. <coughs> Oops. Yep. I'm going to try to copy that link into the chat right now. It's just, I'm going to do that. I have to get off the presentation to do it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> i got a few there. Let's see if I can get back. Um, nothing but problems this morning. Technology is always fun. It is. <laughs> I'm telling you this morning has been nothing but technological difficulties for me. After my computer made me completely. I got it in, JC. Did you? Okay, thank oh, yeah. you. Yes, you're welcome. All right. Sorry, y'all. So let's see if we can get to the results people are putting in here in a second. See our word cloud there. Get just another minute. Anybody else has words to put in? I think it's always fun to sort of watch these change. And of course, the words that are larger, if you haven't used this before, the words that are larger are the ones that are being mentioned multiple times. <laughs> and we see a lot of creative, reflective, dedicated, organized, caring, and then so many synonyms for some of those words, collaborative, determined. So these are some really, really good words. I'm going to get back over to our slideshow in the interest of time, so we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions. But I'll put that link back up at the end. So the first thing that we really want to kind of dive into are those four, I'm sorry, five core propositions that are going to be the basis for everything that you do as you are preparing to submit your portfolios and your work for uh, national board certification. And um, if you were here yesterday for the live session, uh, Dr. Sibley you know, had us repeat these after her. This is something that you will probably end up committing to memory because it's so important. And you're going to need to be coming back to this over and over. So the first one, teachers are committed to students and their learning. Second is teachers know the subjects they teach and how to teach those subjects to students. So it's not only about content knowledge, but it's also about that pedagogical, how do you teach this to your students? Teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning. Teachers 
think systemically about their practice and they learn from experience. So that's where we get that reflective piece, which is so important to be able to reflect on our experiences and find ways that we can continually improve our practice. And then number five, teachers are members of learning communities. And a lot of the things that you're going to hear today um, are probably things that you are already doing in your classroom as a teacher. For example, number five, teachers are members of learning communities. You're here and you are learning about this and you're taking a step toward becoming a national board certified teacher. So you are already a member of a learning community and you're already doing things that are here. We already know if you weren't committed to your students, then you wouldn't be here trying to get undergo this process. So as we go through, you're going to recognize some of the things that you already do. And so a matter, you know, one of the things that's, that's kind of what it comes down to is just showing MBCT that you already do these things, kind of proving them and showing how they impact your students' learning. All right, on this slide, we have a um, quick video that is just sort of an introduction to the process. Okay. was just proving that you're already an excellent teacher and being able to do it in a way that is recognized by an organization. Well, what I didn't realize what happened to me while I went for national board certification is that it, it changed me as a professional. I think becoming board certified is a way to say, I take this seriously. I think it's always good to be a model for students that learning is important. And I thought that this was an opportunity to not just gain some recognition, but to to learn about myself and to learn about my practice and to hopefully improve as an educator. The five core propositions are a touchstone, I think, for National Board Certified Teachers. It just reminds us of what is at the core of our profession. I think just those five core propositions are what we want to do as teachers. We want to be reflective. We want to be experts in our subject area. We want to know our kids and know what they need. It really summed up for me the, the architecture of accomplished teaching and how one goes about from becoming a novice teacher, the more experienced teacher, to becoming a professional and hopefully someday an expert teacher. And I think that the five core propositions um, clearly lay out what rigorous standards are for a teacher. Accomplished teachers model strategies for dealing with the doubts that students may experience, helping them realizing that frustrating moments often are where and when learning occurs. Those moments produce a true joy of education, the satisfaction of accomplishment. Okay. So one thing that I think that's important to recognize about this process is that this is, this is not a new thing. This has been around for a long time. It started in, I believe, 1998. And, and so it's, it's been around for a while. And the purpose of this was to help elevate the teaching profession and having a way of being certified, almost like a doctor, you know, it becomes a board certified surgeon or a board certified, whatever their specialty is. Um, this was a way of teachers being able to prove that they are distinguished and we are experts in our field and we are professionals. So these Five propositions come from um, the, <clears throat> the national boards, what teachers should know and be able to do. Uh, so we're gonna go into just a little bit about each of these five. So the first one, proposition one, is that teachers are committed to students and their learning. And you can probably, as I go through this, think about ways that, and things that you do in your classroom and ways that you can prove that you are already committed to your students and you are committed to their learning process. Uh, one way is that we recognize differences in our students. We adjust our practice to meet those students' needs. So, you know, when you are uh, differentiating in your classroom and you're helping, you know, because not every student is going to learn exactly the same way. So you may be helping one student in one way. You may have had to develop alternate resources or other ways of teaching or reteaching for another student. Uh, we understand how our students develop and learn, and that is something where we can reflect on the years of experience that we have and, you know, kind of develop that understanding of we know what our student is capable of doing. Um, that we treat our students equitably. Now, equitably is not always equal, but we are providing what they need so that everybody has an equal chance at success. This is more than just about the cognitive development of students. 
it is not just about their learning processes, but it is about kind of everything. Um, you know, knowing our students' backgrounds, where they come from, you know, what what is going on with them. And that's going to look different depending on the age of your students. But, you know, just showing that it's more than just a number, they're more than a grade. It's more than just, you know, someone who is sitting there in front of you, but you really understand each of your students and what those students need. And so all of this is about the students who are in front of you right now, not theoretical students who you might have in the future or who you had in the past. It's about dealing with the students that you have and making sure that you know those students as people. And Michelle, feel free to jump in anytime if you need to. All right, next is Proposition 2. And Proposition 2 is that teachers know the subjects they teach and we know how to teach those subjects to students. So we understand how our subject needs to be organized, how we can connect it to other school disciplines, um, you know, writing across the content area or, you know, how you work with, um, you know, a teacher in a different area or at a different grade level, um, those vertical meetings and things like that. We know how to teach these subjects to our students. We know how to impart our, the knowledge that we already have and that we provide different paths to knowledge, that there's not just one way to learn. There are multiple ways that students can arrive at mastery. And so that's one thing that, that um, is really important that we are able to demonstrate that we don't just allow our students like one way, you know, one choice, but we provide them many different opportunities. All right. Let's go on to number three. All right, proposition three is that teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning. So this is not only like classroom management, like what we think about like behavior and, and minimizing disruptions for other students, but using multiple methods to meet our goals, using um, different types of assessments, uh, formative and summative assessments, um, that we are supporting students in various different types of settings and groups, whole groups, small groups, if we need to do, uh, you know, individual settings with some students, um, that we are valuing student engagement. They're not just passive learners, they are engaged in what we are doing, and that we are assessing them regularly and providing them with feedback so that they can improve and that they can meet those instructional goals, and that we're getting our students involved in a learning process so that they are able to look at for themselves and self-assess and see where they are so that they can take ownership of that learning and they can figure out like what they need and communicate that to us as well. So um, this is, you know, all about, you know, looking at our students' growth and seeing like how we can work in different ways to help our students grow and achieve those learning goals. Okay, proposition four is that teachers think systematically about their practice and learn from experience. And I think this is something that all teachers really do. The longer that you've been in a classroom or the longer that you've been teaching a subject, the more experience you have to draw from. And so sometimes teachers have to make difficult choices. Sometimes we have to test our judgment and know that maybe a textbook that we've been provided is not the best choice of materials for this class. And we have to maybe choose a different type of material, or we need to be able to use feedback that we're given or keep up on research to improve our practice and to impact that student learning in a positive way. If we find out about something new or some new research that's out there and we can take that and apply it to our class, maybe it's not what was in what the, what was provided to us by our district, but we might have to make that choice, you know, if that's what's right for our students. And then we will be able to defend those choices because we are thinking about this and we're learning from where we've been in the past and moving forward from that. And proposition five is that teachers are members of learning communities. And in this way that we are collaborating with other professionals, not only um, in our schools and in our classrooms, but with families, our students' families, with our communities, how can we involve the community in order to, um, you know, further our students' learning? Uh, you know, getting in outside speakers or experts to talk with our students, 
um, you know, going to professional development, learning from other teachers, opening our doors so that people can come in and observe our classrooms and give us constructive feedback. Um, all of those things go into being a member of a learning community. Like I said, because you're here today, we know that that's something that you're already doing. So if there any questions or anything, I feel like I'm speeding through this, but it's so hard on a Zoom when there's not a lot of <laughs> interaction. So if anybody has any questions at any time, just put those into the chat. Okay, if you have not seen this chart before, you will see it a lot with uh, National Board materials. And for me, as I was working through national boards, this became something that I really base a lot of my writing on and a lot of my reflection. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward, um, starting at the bottom with what you do first and moving up to what you do sixth, and then it kind of starts over again at the bottom. So this is something that builds on itself. And it really makes a lot of sense, or at least it did to me. This was a great place for me just when I was getting started with the process to look at this and just really think about my processes and my lesson planning and my writing. So the first thing is that you know your students. So starting at the bottom, the first thing, your students, who are they? Where are they now? What do they need? In what order do they need this? And where can I start? And this is gonna depend entirely on your classroom, which is why in, uh, National Board is such an individual process because my school and my you know, situation and my students are probably very different than your school and your situation and your students. So we all have different things going on in our classrooms. We all have very unique situations because as we all know, no two schools are exactly the same. So you want to meet your students where they are. So for one, uh, one example, my students are, I teach in a Title I school. It's a very small, very rural community. Um, I have about 70% of my students who, um, who are on free and reduced lunch. Um, so some of my students come to school hungry and that's a need that they have. And before I can get them to care about putting a period at the end of the sentence, they have to be fed. So we have to make sure that all of those needs are being met. And so that's something that I can write about in national boards that, you know, I'm having to do this for my students before I can do that. Um, I get to know my students really well and their families. It is a pretty small community. So I could really talk a lot about my students' backgrounds. Um, so that is something that I think is really important to be able to do um, and, and talk about exactly who your students are, especially those that you're choosing their work samples. The assessors, they want to know who is this kid that you're writing about. So I think that's just, to me, that was one of the most important things in doing my national board journey. Uh, so you've started there, you know your students. And the next thing that you're going to do is you're gonna take those students that you know and you're going to set high, appropriate, and worthwhile goals for those students. And the important thing on this part is that you're setting these goals for these students at this time in this setting. These are not goals that you set last year. They're not goals that you're you know, planning to set in the future. They are the goals that you have set for these particular students who are sitting in front of you right now based on that first thing, which is that you know them. Going on up to the third is that you are going to implement your instruction that is designed to attain the goals that you set here in number two, which are based on number one, the students that you know. So you've set your goals and now you have designed your instruction to help these students meet those goals. All right, then you're gonna go on to the fourth, which is that you're going to evaluate. You're going to look and you're going to see, did your students meet those high worthwhile goals that you set? If they did, then that's great and you move on. If they didn't, you have to reflect. Why not? What happened? What could I have done better? Now, National Boards is not looking for perfection. You know, a lot of this, you know, they're looking for reflection and that you can see a way that you could have improved this lesson, right? So, you know, here, do you have to go back and reteach? Or if everybody met the goal, then, you know, how did that happen? You know, why did everyone meet the goal? You know, so moving on, going to the fifth one, we're going to reflect on the student learning. We're going to reflect on how effective we were as teachers. 
And then we're going to address any particular concerns that we had or particular issues that came up. Then we're going to move on and we're going to set new goals. We're going to set new, high, worthwhile, appropriate goals for these students at this time in this place where you are based on that you know them. And then it just goes, you know, again and again in that pattern. And to me, when I was starting out and I was starting my writing, this was just invaluable to me because I could keep referring back to this because it makes me answer those questions like, why am I doing this? You know, how is this goal that I've set appropriate for these students? So, um, and I did not click on here to show you the other thing. So I'm sorry, y'all, not on my game. So then we're going to set our new goals. So um, got busy talking, not clicking. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go on to the next slide. And this is about choosing your certificate um, or your certificate area. So there are 25 different certificate areas, and those vary based on the content area that you're teaching. Also, the age range of your students. So there's a lot of different choices there. And depending on what your content area is, you may have a choice of which certificate that you can can pick from. Now, if you are teaching seniors, you know, you will only be able to teach. I mean, you will only be able to choose a certificate for that upper age band. But, um, you know, some certificate levels have some different age bands in there so that you'll be able to choose which one is the best for you. Um, let me see if I can put this. Or Michelle, do you, can you put that link in the chat? Or, whoops. Ah, okay. I sure can. Thank you. So I can back up there. And I'm going to pull up. Well, that didn't work, did it? Let's see. I'll go this way. So don't go to that one. Maybe go to this one. Um, I'm going to go to our candidate resources. And then here is a guide to choosing the right certificate. So we may need to put this one in the chat instead. Let me see if I can do that. I'm failing at Zoom today, guys. <laughs> the one that I posted is incorrect, so we don't need to follow yeah. that. Let me put this one in there. Still wanting to pull up in the meter. <sighs> Y'all, today, not my day, not my day. All right, Jesse, I got it in. You got it. Okay. That's the second one. Okay. There we go. All right, so under your candidate resources, um, there's choosing the right certificate. You can also, this is a wonderful website if you haven't been here, because this is going to have all of the information that you're ever going to need about how to um, move forward with national boards. So going on to choosing the right certificate. This gives you all the different information by certificate area. So you can scroll through and look at your subject area and then you can choose from there your age band and and it will tell you and you can look at the instructions for all of these different ones and you know figure out which one is going to be the best certificate for you um one example i'm an english teacher and so i teach middle school and i primarily have seventh grade um or i did when i was going through certification so instead of going through ELA, I did my certificate in literacy and reading language arts. Now this is early and middle childhood. So the age band for my certificate is actually ages three through 12. I'm on the extreme upper end of that age band, but because more than half of my students were 12, when, we, when I started the process, then I could use that certificate because I was much more interested in the, the reading and the literacy part 
of ELA than I was the actual, like the writing and, um, and literature section. So if you have a, you know, a, a class that's kind of could sort of fit either age band, you know, you will have some choices that you can make. And then um, obviously if you are an elementary teacher and you teach all subjects, um, you, know, you can choose to be a generalist or you can choose a subject level, you know, a subject area, um, depending on, you know, what it is that you are teaching and what the age band is. I'm glad you said that, JC. Um, whenever I first started the process and I was looking at certificate areas, I was a general education classroom teacher. And so I looked and I was like, okay, I have to do the generalist portion. Um, and so that's just what I did because I thought, you know, since I'm a general education teacher, that's where I need to go. Um, but just like JC said, there are different areas, like there's a reading, um, there's different areas. So really look at these and think about what ages you work with and which areas you really want to focus on um, before you make that decision. Because once you start in that area, that's kind of the area that you have to stay in. Yes. And especially now that I'm moving from ELA to science, that literacy component is really going to help me in the science classroom because there's a lot of literacy in, in teaching science, a lot of content area literacy. So that is actually going to help me with my new job versus if I had just stayed an English teacher, I probably would have, you know, if I had stayed with ELA, I might have just needed to stay in an English classroom because it's much more focused on that. So, you know, if you are able to, um, you know, make a choice on there, please look through the different options and, um, and read the instructions for those because some of them may stand out to you and you may say like, oh, this one looks much more like what I'm doing in my classroom and it will be easier for me to show my evidence for this certificate instead of that certificate. So not everyone will have those options, but if you do, you know, definitely look at everything that's out there. JC, Michelle, we've got a question in the chat about what would you suggest for a reading intervent interventionist who services K through five? Uh, if you're a reading interventionist, I would probably go with that reading and literacy um, language arts. It's gonna focus a lot more on or you can use it to focus a lot more on like the science of reading and the process of teaching children to read um, versus students who are already reading and you are like analyzing what what is being read so if you're an interventionist that's probably what I would choose but again I mean I can't make that decision for you so definitely go back and look at the the instructions for it and the different parts of the components um, because uh, especially I think component two is different. There are different instructions for component two on, on the different um, um, certificate areas. Sorry, y'all. So, uh, so look at that particularly for anything that you're looking at. Uh, that component two is going to have very different instructions. And then also component one is the test, uh, the content area test. And so you're going to want to, if you're doing that one, um, you know, look at what the sample questions for component one and the constructive response questions for component one and see, you know, if you feel like you would be comfortable studying for that and um, let that person know and, um, you know, knowing that content area. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, but there are, um, you know, lots of lots of and lots of things there that you can look at. So I'm not going to take you through that entire site right now, but that's a a good site for you to go to. And it's just uh, you know just off of the main national board site, mbpts.org. All right. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to look at is um, are you a potential recruit? Now this has just changed. Like um, Dr. Shields just announced this to us um, this week that this change has been made. So um, up until I think this coming up September, you had to have completed three years of teaching experience before you could begin working toward national board certification. The change is being made this year in September, I believe is the first day of it, that candidates may begin working towards certification with less than three years of experience in the classroom. So even if you are a first year teacher, you can go ahead and register with national boards and you can start working on components. 
Now, the caveat there is that you can't complete certification before reaching three years of experience. So they, you, you can't finalize everything and turn everything in before the end of the third year and, and become an MBCT, but you can go ahead and begin working on it earlier in your career if that's a choice that you want to make, if you feel comfortable working on that. And I know that there are some people who have done like ed TPA, which I understand is very similar. I did not do ed TPA, but um, I understand that some of the writing for that is very similar to some of the writing for national boards. So if that's something that you've done very recently, um, some of that experience that you have there, you may be able to sort of roll that into the writing that you're doing for national board. Of course, you will have to start over with your own students and, you know, and your own goals for those students. You can't use anything that you did in like student teaching or, or, you know, previously, but, um, but you can go ahead if you want to, you know, sign up and take the component one test that can be done before reaching three years of experience. Um, other than that, um, a bachelor's degree, a valid state teaching license or state licensure uh, requirements for a school counselor. And if there are any other prerequisites for your specific certificate area, for example, if you are um, certifying in world languages, like any language, then you would have to take the world language test. Um, I'm not sure, and, and Michelle, you may know, um, I'm not sure what certificates have those types of prerequisites. I don't think that there's very many, but that would be something that would be in your instructions and it should be made very clear in your instructions that this is what you have to have. Uh, I know there wasn't anything like that for, for mine. So, um, but that's, that is what you have to do and be and have before you can begin. And probably most of you have already gotten three years of teaching experience, but that is the new change for this year. And Michelle, are you, do you want to start here or do you want me to continue on here? It's completely up to you. I'm good either way. <laughs> this is the part where we're going to start talking about the components. <laughs> so this is the introductory slide to the components. And then I think we have specific slides about each component. Yes. And I think this is where we had the, this is where I had the most questions on my live session on uh, Wednesday. So if you have questions about any of the components, you know, definitely feel free to ask those because it is sort of overwhelming. And this is kind of a lot of information to throw out there at once. But again, there are uh, sessions also about each of these four components that you can attend, um, that there are some pre-recorded sessions. And then also your um, state in-service center We'll also have information for you about the different components. So, Michelle, I'm going to go ahead. I'll okay. jump in. Do you mind if we switch and so yeah. that I can share my screen? Let's do that. Thank you. All right. Can everybody see? We're good. JC, is my share screen showing? Yes. Awesome. All right, guys. So, Jace, you did an amazing job. That was such a good introduction to the five core propositions. Um, lots and lots of information, and I totally get that. It is an overwhelming process, but once you get started, just like JC has said earlier, you're going to realize that so many of these things you already know, you already do it. It's just being able to show how you know it and what you're doing in your classroom. Um, so she's kind of given you the introduction, five core propositions, which is definitely where you need to start. Um, the book, I think it was on slide three that she showed. Um, it was called What Teachers Should Know and Be Able to Do. It is an online resource um, on the um, National Board website, but it is very, very important that you read through that because as you're thinking about your components, as you're thinking about um, starting on this process, you're going to want to really think about the language they use. You're going to want to think about the things that they're looking for because you want to incorporate that into everything that you do for this process. All right, so we're going to start. This is just kind of introduction, just like JC said, to the four components of um, each one of the um, subject areas. Before we go on, though, I do want to show. Um, on 
the website that JC, the one that the second link that I sent earlier that JC showed you guys, um, I want you guys to see on this website, it is like my favorite. This is the one that I went to all the time. You see, can you guys see the standards and instructions page? Perfect. So if you scroll all the way down to that area, so this is, and this is helpful when you're trying to determine which area you want to go into, what, com what com uh, the components are, um, and all of that. If you scroll down to the bottom, there's a drop down box. And so in this drop down box is all of the different areas that you can choose from. And to me, this is just an easier way to look at it. Um, so when I first started out, I was, of course, going to be generalist. I was teaching kindergarten at the time. So I clicked on generalist. And on the right side, it tells you, OK, which level do you want to look at? and it breaks it down. So I was kindergarten, so I did the early childhood. And then all of this information at the bottom is gonna show up. So it's gonna give you the instructions for all four of your components. It's gonna give you um, the standards that go with that component. So all of this information is right there at your fingertips. Um, and so each time that you're wanting to look, and so if, if I were you and I was trying to think, okay, First thing I need to know, what area am I focusing on? Kind of look through this and see, okay, what do I really wanna think about? What am I gonna be teaching in the future? So you know where you're wanting to go with it. Um, and then also you click on the components and it shows you all of the directions for the components. Um, it shows you what you'll have to do, what it's looking for, all of that is right there for you. And so um, I know as she was saying earlier, some of them do have special requirements. And so that would be listed in here as well. So the, if you wanted to check that out. But that's just, a, I really like that at the bottom. Just, it's just easy for me to use. Yes, All right, thank so, you for that. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said, thank you for showing that. That's, oh, that's yes. a good thing. And I used it all the time. I still yes. use it all the time. I just love that part. All right, so as we're thinking about the four components, first component um, is going to be your content knowledge. So after you've chosen your area, and so for me, it was generalist. So I was trying to think, okay, what all do I need to know for ages three through eight? So this is gonna be everything that you do in the classroom. It's things that you've learned in college, um, things that you've learned through professional development. All of those things are gonna be kind of tied together. So it is a computer-based assessment. So it's something that you would sign up for um, you would go to a testing center and you would actually take this test there. And inside this test, you're gonna have about 45 um, multiple choice questions and you have a total of 60 minutes to do those. And then you have three constructed response. So that's gonna be where it gives you a, um, a what's the word for it? Can't think. It's gonna give you a problem. So it might tell you, okay, so this teacher um, is working on this math problem, what are the next steps that she should take? So it's gonna give you that type of things like a real life application. And you have to come up with all of the steps that you would take and you have to put those in. So it's gonna be a, if this was in your classroom, how would you address it? And so there'll be three of those and that's gonna be about 30 minutes each. Um, so it's really just knowing all of the things that you're supposed to know, things you've learned in college, things that you've learned along the way, and being able to apply those um, in different situations. So that's the first component. The second component is gonna be differentiation and instruction. So this is going to be a portfolio. So you are going to, and all of the instructions are different for each component. Um, and those will be listed in your instructions, but it is a portfolio of student work. So you're going to find students in your class and you're gonna say, okay, so I have this goal for them. These are the standards we're working on. This is the goal that I have for these students. So you're gonna collect work samples from the beginning before you started your instruction. And then you are going to begin your instruction. You're gonna be very intentional of what you're doing how you're differentiating that instruction. And you are going to be able to say everything that you've done with these students. How are you able to help them? And then what they're wanting is within six to eight weeks, what is the growth that you've seen? And so this is a very reflective process because you have to continually look at work samples, 
as a formative assessment and think to yourself, okay, so I know this is the goal for them. Have they gotten there? And if not, what do I need to do to change it? So it's continuously looking at that and trying to figure out what do I need to do differently this time? How can I help them to reach their goal? And so that's going to be um, a collection of those work samples, like I said, from the beginning to the end, and then a really reflective um, comparison of, okay, did they reach their goal? If not, what are my next steps? Component three, um, I have to admit, it was the one I was most nervous about. However, it was the most fun. I really enjoyed this one. Um, this is the one where you get to video yourself. So in your classroom, you are going to do um, two separate video or two separate um, subject areas, different, uh, I know in generalist, it was two different subjects and two different um, ways that your class was made up. So it might be a small group and then a whole group. Um, but each content area is, I'm sure, different in that way. But it's you taking a video of yourself teaching a lesson. And so you're trying to make sure that all of that stuff, all those components, those five core propositions, you're using all of those and it's evident when they watch that video. So that's why it's so important to make sure you know those um, propositions and you're using those. But they wanna see, okay, how do you address the students that get it? And then how do they, you address the ones that don't? Um, what is the differentiation that you're using? How do you speak to your students? How do students speak to each other? What is the climate and culture of your classroom? So this is really a huge picture of what does your classroom look like? Um, I feel, in my opinion, this is probably the most telling of us as teachers is because they're actually seeing us in action. They're seeing what we're doing um, and kind of what it looks like. But also the reflective piece of when you are watching yourself teaching is unlike anything else in my opinion, because you're able to see as a teacher in the moment, you're focused on a certain group of students or certain individuals. But when you're sitting and watching that video of yourself, you're able to see all of the students in the classroom. Do you have a lot of students that are off task or all of your students on task? Are there certain things that kids are struggling with that you may not see otherwise? So I feel like it is a, um, a huge eye opener to actually see yourself in action and see your classroom on camera, um, but also being able to write about it, being able to see not only your strengths, but your areas of growth and talk about those as well um, in the written commentary whenever you get ready to do that. But this was, I, pro I have to say, probably one of my favorites. What do you think, JC? <laughs> I really, I really end up enjoying it. And I will tell you that I certified in 2020 and I did component three last. So I had tried to do some videos early in the year, um, you know, just to get my students used to being on camera. And so they could just sort of forget that the camera was there. And I did not do anything fancy with my camera. I used my iPhone and I put it on a shelf and that was how I videoed everything that I sent in. Um, but, um, I was so glad at the end of the year that I had done this and because the lessons that I had planned to video that I was really excited about writing about, I didn't get to do because we went home in March. And um, so it, to me, and I mean, I know that there were, there were lots of teachers who did do their classes on Zoom and they videoed that and they turned that in and they certified. But um, I was just very thankful that I had some videos and that even though they were not what I had intended to write about, that was what I had. So that's what I had to write about. And um, it helped me a lot at that time to remember that the National Board Assessors were not looking for a perfect classroom because there's no such thing as a perfect classroom. And I mean, it was very obvious that these lessons were not staged in any way. You know, I have middle schoolers. I have, you know, at the end of the video that I, one of the videos that I submitted, I had this kid at the back of the room. He was just like, oh, you know, rolling his eyes, <laughs> but I could write about that. And so that's what I did. You know, I, I did that in my writing about that portfolio and, uh, and about that video. And okay, here's, you know, here's what this kid was doing and here's what happened after that. And, um, you know, I ended up scoring really well on component three, uh, even though that was probably the one that I was the most nervous about because I do hate listening to myself talk and I, and I hate seeing myself on video. 
So uh, having to watch those videos is probably the most painful thing for me, but um, but it, it ended up being really good. Yes. And it was fun. Yes. And that's, and that is very important. Also, um, just like you said, starting really early, um, just like you, I was like, okay, I'm not comfortable with this. So I'm going to, I had, I believe an iPad, um, that I had placed up and I recorded and that's what I recorded everything on. Um, and a lot of those, I was like, I'm not going to use these. I'm just trying to get used to it, get the kids used to seeing a camera. Um, or the ones that I actually began to use is because I was like, okay, this was a really good lesson. But if I had not had 10 videos that I had recorded to choose from, um, I think it would have been a lot more stressful. So I did like starting early and having lots of things to choose from. So yes, I completely agree there. All right, and then the last component, component four is going to be, um, this sure, is where- I, I think we've got a lot of questions about component. Oh. I think Absolutely. they're going to chat. We might want to stop and address some of those. I was trying to see what, what it's hard to see the chat and everything else on there. Um, let's see what questions do we have? And we can talk about the extra stipend. Um, someone asked about that. And uh, we can talk about that at the end. Um, Emily asked about uh, component one, I'm doing the exceptional needs specialist certification with gifted and talented. And I was wondering if the test would cover all exceptional needs topics. Um, that would be in your instructions for your certificate area. So you're gonna need to look at that certificate area and then your component one instructions and it will tell you everything that's covered. Um, I did not know that there was a certificate that's just for gifted and talented. So um, I would definitely just tell you to go there and look at, at the specific guidelines for component one for your, uh, your certificate. Yeah. And there's and I put, oh, I'm sorry, and, go ahead. Sorry, and I put the link for the, um, the certification candidate center in there. And you can go down to the bottom of it and then pull up what your certification area is. And it has, so there's a question about the parent permission slip and it'll be in there and all of that. Um, a couple of people ask about what portfolios look like. Um, they have very specific instructions for what that will look like. Usually it's, it's going to be mostly like PDF documents, um, but they have very specific places where you upload those. So it is not a Google folder, although I do recommend as you're working on this that you probably want to have a, a Google folder that has all of your stuff in it. You probably also, because uh, I'm, I'm kind of paranoid about losing things, so also possibly like an external hard drive uh, or anywhere else that you can save that stuff because you don't want to risk losing it. Um, Emily, there is an NBCT letter that will come with your instructions that you will need to give out to all of your students at the beginning of the year for, for parent permission. It's a release form and you don't turn those into national board. You just keep those on file um, just in case there were any questions. Um, if you have a parent who does not want to allow their student to be on the video, then you know that student can just leave the room for it or you can see them in an area where they won't be seen on camera. And I do want to um, point out that also for component one, once you go into your um, content area, whatever your focus is on that page I showed you guys earlier, um, it will sh it will give you like different, um, it's kind of like a practice test. Um, it kind of gives you a couple of questions to, so you can see what they look like. And so it kind of gives you an idea of what type of questions they're asking. And then, um... Uh, Rhonda and um, Kimberly had asked about the videos. Um, so for component three, there are two videos. It wants you to show two different modes of teaching. So for example, you could do like a whole group lesson and then you could do a small group lesson or a one-on-one, -on -one, like a tutoring session. They just want you to show two different modalities of teaching. So two different you know, settings sort of. Um, and the length of the video, I, it's, uh, it's not a full class period. It is 10 to 15 minutes. Is that yes, correct? That's correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, so 10 to 15 minutes video. Um, there's no edits allowed in the video, so you can't stop the video and start it again uh, or blur faces or anything like that. Um, it's just you choose the 10 to 15 minutes that you want them to see, and they will not score anything outside of that 15. So if you were to submit, for some reason, an entire class period lesson, they will only score the first 15 minutes. And one thing that I did do, JC, um, was I would record my entire lesson. So if my lesson was 35 minutes long, I recorded the entire 35 minutes. Um, and then within that 35 minutes, you can go in and you can choose which section of that class you want to submit. So if I didn't really like the beginning of my lesson, but the middle of the lesson showed the most evidence, then I'm only going to upload that middle section or the ending section. So I would still record the whole thing. Yes. I would just then look at it and see, okay, which one of these shows the most evidence of all these things that I'm doing. And then that's the part that you want to submit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely record as much as you can. <laughs> I'm just yeah. saying like as often as possible, because you never know, uh, yeah. it'd be something that happens in a class that you didn't expect, but it turns into this great like teaching moment. And then you can use that for a video uh, to send in if, you know, anything that you can write a lot about. That's a video that you want to choose uh, because and there's the, just so much you can yeah. say about it. Go ahead. And on the, um, the test component, like I did mine early childhood. And I've been teaching pre-K for several years, and it had been a long time since I'd had second or third grade. And when I looked and saw what some of the math questions might be, I went to my second and third grade teachers at my school and our um, district math specialists, and I sent them questions. I said, look, I'm studying for national boards. These are some topics that I need to study, and what can you tell me? And they were great resources and to help me kind of refresh and get prepared for it. Absolutely. That's a really That's good point. Mind. I did the same thing, except I went um, backward <laughs> because my <laughs> certification area was like ages three and I teach, you know, seventh and eighth yeah. graders. So <laughs> I went to my kindergarten and my first grade teachers and I was like, okay, tell me about, mm -hmm. you know, tell me about how you do this. And so you know, they were able to give me some really good resources. Um, okay. Lori just asked, can you edit to cut out parts to get down to time? Um, you can cut like from the beginning or the end, but it has to be a complete 10 to 15 minutes. You can't cut in the, like, you can't show like part of the beginning of your lesson and the part of the end of your lesson. It has to be a continuous 10 to 15 minutes. So hopefully that, that makes sense. You can't edit it for time you know, and show a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It has to be one 10 to 15 minute block of your class. But now when you write, you can write about what happened before that and, and what happened after that. And you will, you know, expand on what happened in the video, but you can only have one 10 to 15 minute segment and no edits in the middle of that. And... And there's a question about the um, specific or recommended timeline for the order of components. Um, there is no um, certain order that you're supposed to do the components. Um, everybody does them differently. Um, the way I started is probably not the way that JC started. So it's really just looking at those components and seeing which ones for this upcoming school year, which one will I be most comfortable doing? Um, I didn't know what I was doing when I first started. I just kind of jumped in. I don't, I don't know why, but I went with component one. Um, I did component one my first year. And then the second year I did two, three, and four, which was, I would not recommend. Um, but I know most people usually take two years and they'll do uh, two components the first year and then two different ones the last year. Um, JC, what did you do? That's kind of what I did. Um... Also, and I think this will probably make more sense when we get to the scoring part, we talk about the weighted yes. scoring. Um, components one and three are worth more points and you know they're heavier weighted than components two and four. So I decided I would split it up and I would do components one and two start because one being the test and that for some reason was not as, I, I'm a test taker. So, uh, you know, so component one was not as scary to me. It's like the idea of taking the test. I just had to study for the test and go take it. Um, so 
I wanted to get my scores back on those two components and then see where I was because I thought like, okay, if I go in there and I take this test and I bomb it, then I'm going to know that like either I've chosen the wrong certificate <laughs> or like I'm really going to need to to revisit and see, you know, know what I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I wanted to, to do that. And then also because that component one is weighted so heavily, I knew if I did well on it, then that, you know, would, would kind of answer that question for me. Like, am I in the right certificate? Do, am I doing this the correct way? Now that's probably not everybody's thought process, but that was mine. So, and then the reason that I chose component two instead of component four for my lighter one is because component two was shorter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can do one and two. And I, and, um, the teacher next door to me did all four in a year mm -hmm. and she certified and did great. But now she has grown children. So she did not have kids at home. I have two kids at home and um, they're very involved in different types of activities. And so I knew that I did not have the time on the weekends to spend all of my time writing and working on national boards. And that's, you know, a lot of what she did, you know, during Christmas break and that sort of thing was to work on her components. And I, I, I knew I couldn't take all of my time away from my children like that. So I decided, you know, I'm just going to do two and then I'll do the next two and then go from there. So, um, so that's what I did. What'd you do, Tina? I did, um, when I had gone to boot camp before I started the process, someone had recommended doing two and four together because there was some overlap on the two of them so that's what I did and it was tons of writing because you know those two components are very heavy with the writing but it did work because they were right because four has a lot about assessment which I was having to do assessment for component two so a lot of my activities had overlap and plus I was scared to death about the video component so I did the second year the video component and the um, the test component. I did see that after doing all of the writing for two and four and three, that when I got to that test component and I was reading the, um, the, the answer responses, I could zero in and go, oh, that's national board writing. That's what I was writing for um, my written components. So that I think helped me do better on the written component because I already had a feel of what accomplished teaching was just from doing all of that writing but yeah. I did two and four together okay um I know a lot of people say uh, that they wait for component one at the very end because components two three and four they're doing the research they're trying to figure out what to do so a lot of that they are doing that heavy professional development they're trying to get everything you know ready so they're they're really good with component one by then um but like I said I just I didn't know what I was doing to be honest um and I had just had a baby um he was three months old when I took that component one test so um it was it's just looking at the components and seeing what can I handle um it is possible to do it um do all four in one year but I think you have, what is it? You have to do all four components within, is it three, three years? years? Mm -hmm. I think you, have if three you need years. to retake, then you have up to five years um, from the time that you begin. Mm -hmm. So you have to do all of them within three years, at least try each one of them once. Um, and so the last component, I think component four to me was um, the most difficult. It is, it has the most requirements requirements, the most forms that you have to fill out. Um, and it took, it, it's a lot of getting stuff together um, and going throughout the year. So what component four is, is really just a collection of all the stuff that you've done. This is going to include your assessment, what type of assessments you're using, why you're using them, how you use the data. Um, it's going to be those learning communities that you are a part of and ones that you lead yourself. Um, because they're really looking for those teacher leaders, ones that are willing to take that step and, you know, help other teachers. Um, and then also your, your knowledge of planning. What do you do to plan? How do you get all of that together? And then are you a reflective teacher? Are you looking at all the things that you've done in the school year and always thinking about what can I do better next time? What didn't go well? What went really well? 
So um, component four to me was probably, um, it took me the longest. It wasn't the hardest writing part, but just the collection of evidence it took me an entire school year and it, it took a lot of thought for me. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, I think that they start with, um, or they start working on component four very early on, and then they work on it like in increments throughout the school year, because yeah. it, it's, it's just a lot. And then you know, looking on your screen here about the assessment weights, I mean, it's, it's always kind of ironic to me that component four, usually a lot of people say it takes them the longest. It definitely took me the longest. Yes. <laughs> and uh, then it's not, it's, it's not weighted very heavily. It's only 15%. I know it's crazy, work. isn't it? So <laughs> <laughs> I did spend just crazy amounts of time on it. <laughs> yes, but it made me feel a little bit better that it wasn't weighted as heavily. Yes. Oh, because um, I was like, I can do really, really well on these areas. And so maybe it, you know, won't be as big a deal. Um, but just like JC was saying, all of the components, all four components have different weights. Um, so it's what they deem is the most important. And so component three, of course, is the heaviest weighted is 30% of your score um, of the total score you have to have at the end. Um, so you have component three is at 30%, component two is at 15%. Um, component one is gonna be 20% and then component four is 15%. So that may also kind of um, help you figure out which ones you wanna do and when you wanna do them. Um, because in just a second, I'll show you that there is a calculator that you can use. So um, this calculator, I used it probably a thousand times my very last year that I was working. Yes. Um, depending on how I felt about my components, I would go in and it allows you to put in what your scores were for different components and then what score will you have to have for your upcoming component. Um, so that to me, uh oh. That to me was very beneficial. Hold on just a second. Let's see if I can find that. There we go. Um, I thought it was on the next slide, maybe not. All right, so, but these are the different weighted assessments. So you kind of can get an idea of um, which ones you want to put the most focus on. Like I said, component three to me was the most fun and the most eye-opening. It helped me the most as a teacher. So it kind of makes sense to me that it's worth the most because it's actual snapshot of what is going on in your classroom and what it looks like. All right, so the essential resources, um, you can scan the QR code, or if you look right here, it's going to show you, um, it's the same website that we looked at earlier that gives you all of the beginning information. So it tells you where, um, all the different content areas are, it gives you important dates. So if you're um, planning on starting this upcoming school year, it gives you the dates of when do you need to register by, when are the different components to you, all of that. Um, and it also gives you that, that bottom, that drop down menu so that you can kind of toggle between and figure out which area that you wanna focus on. So that's a very good um, place to kind of get started. All right, so just like I said earlier, after you figured out um, which component area, which area you're gonna focus on, certificate area, the first thing you wanna do is go through and read those standards. You wanna look at the components and you're trying to figure out, okay, what did they want me to do? What is the purpose of this component? So it's gonna be unique to each area. So that's why you really have to go through and look at each one of your areas um, because they are so different. Just like mine's very different from what JC did. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer a lot of specific questions on different content areas because they're different. So it's always important to go right to um, your instructions and your standards to figure out what they're looking for. Um, and this is not the state course of study. So you're not looking at the state course of study, but it is a set of standards for national board certified teachers. Um, do we have a link there for that? Because at first I thought, I have to admit, I did think, okay, so that's, they're wanting me to look at those, um, the standards for my state, and that's what they're focused on. And that was kind of confusing to me when I first started, because I thought they were called, you know, because we keep, you know, we're always told, you know, your standards, your standards, your standards. And that's, you know, in your classroom, we're talking about the state standards, but when you were writing for national board, they were talking about national board standards. Yes. So I've got a link in the chat. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. 
Um, so there are the national board standards, which I have to admit, I did go through every single one of those. I read it front to back. Um, I wanted to see exactly what are they looking for. Um, so I read every one of those to try to figure out what, how do they want me to speak? Because when you're doing those written commentaries and you're writing, they're looking for specific language. Are you using the national board lingo? So use, using that vocabulary, using those words, putting all the information in that they want um, is very important. But then also the standards for your content area is very important as well. So you're wanting to look at all of that. So lots of reading up front, trying to figure out what are they asking for? What do I need to make sure that I include in my writing and when I'm teaching? Um, and so go through, I mean, read it from cover to cover look at it, highlight it, think about, okay, these are the important words. I need to make sure when I do my writing, I include all of these words, highlight those words, um, go through those verbs of what are they looking for? What do they want me to be um, is very important. Um, but just really making sure that you look at those and that you use those throughout all of the components that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Um, Suzanne said yesterday in one of our sessions, you don't want the assessors to have to go on an Easter egg hunt. Like you want to use those words because they're going to have a checklist of things that they are looking for in your writing. And so if you have used the language that national board uses, it's going to be very easy for your assessors to find like, okay, here's evidence of this. Here is where, you know, she said this, or he did that in the classroom. So, you know, if you can use the language that they use, and it's just like when I teach my students, you know, to answer a writing prompt, um, if you use the words that you're given, it makes it much easier for the person reading it to, to understand what you're talking about, to get a clear picture of whether you showed evidence of those things. Absolutely. And then also, I was always terrified that, like she said, the Easter egg hunt, what if they didn't find that egg? And so I was worried that something would be lost in my paper. I would have it. It would be evident that they don't see it. So um, I like that you um, pointed that out. So that's very important, making sure that you're very, very clear with where your answers are and um, that you have all of those different components in there. Um, so I don't know if this is in this PowerPoint or not, but um, I, when you are going through your guidelines for your portfolios, there will be a list of questions that that you are supposed to be answering within that portfolio. And I know a lot of candidates do this, and this really helped me is to type out the question and then make sure that I had answered that question so that it was in that order and it would be easy for the assessor to find. And then I would go back and erase the book because you don't have room. <laughs> you know, there's exactly. no space for you to leave those questions in there because you do have to be so concise. But uh, when you're doing your drafts and you can have the question there, and then you know that that question has been answered. So yes. uh, and this, that may be in here somewhere, and I, but I just wanted to make sure that people understand that you do have a list of questions. It's not just very open-ended. No, it is very, like, like she said, it, they, they list them out for you. You know exactly what you're supposed to be looking for. You know what you're supposed to be showing. Um, so making sure, and this kind of goes with the three C's, being very clear on, okay, so I knew that the student learned this when I saw them do this, this, and this. So being very clear and very consistent in your writing, using all of that vocabulary, um, and kind of, kind of goes back to like, I know even teaching, you know, first, second grade, whenever you have a question, you restate the question into your answer. Um, so kind of even, you know, just going back to that, making sure that you or saying, okay, this is how I'm answering this question so that they see that you did put it in there, that you're very clear with it um, and that you're very concise. Um, because like JC said, a lot of the, or all the written commentary, there are very specific guidelines. It can only be this many pages. Once you get to this many pages, you have to stop. So um, a lot of that writing, I know some of us are used to like the fluff, we have to take it out. It has to be very clear and very concise on what they're looking for, because you only have so much room to actually answer those questions. All right, and so those three C's again, just be very, very careful when you're writing uh, your commentary. 
um, which is just the written portion of explaining what you've done, what your portfolio looks like, or what your video looks like. Just making sure that you answer every single one of those questions, making sure that you're including the evidence. How do we know the student was learning? Can you tell them how you knew the student's learning or what you did and why you did it? Um, but to be very convincing as well, make sure that they know that you made this decision and this is why you made this decision. And it doesn't always, just like Jason said earlier, it doesn't have to be picture perfect. It doesn't have to be the perfect lesson. They know that these are students, nothing is going to go perfectly. And so owning that, saying, I didn't like this part of my lesson because the students didn't learn this goal or reach this goal or answer this question. So next time, and then tell how you would change it. How are you gonna make it better? Um, so including all of that in there, making sure that you're just giving them as much information in that short, um, short little paper. And I know it sounds like a lot of writing because you're thinking, oh, I have 10 pages. But then when you get to it and you're starting to put all the stuff in there, you're like, this really isn't enough pages. Um, so just being very, very clear when you're doing that writing. Definitely. <laughs> and for me, I think too, and a lot of teachers maybe are like this, that it's kind of hard for us to brag on ourselves. Like it's hard to say like, oh, I did this and I'm a great teacher. And, you know, because yeah. that's not what we are used to doing. And that's kind of what you have to do here. I mean, like basically, you know, this is all about like tooting your own horn and, and telling them, you know, I made this decision and, and using this action verbs, like I chose to do this and here's why, and this is what happened. Um, so I think that's, that's something that is a little bit difficult at the, for national board writing. It's a lot different than, you know, the kind of writing that you may be used to doing, which is more descriptive. Yes. And this kind of ties into what you were just talking about. Uh, so this pyramid, I love this. Um, as you were thinking about all of your components, as you're thinking about the writing, the videoing, the work samples, the what is a very small portion of what we're trying to show. Yes, we wanna have what they're doing or what our goal is or what we're working on, but most importantly, we need to know why is it significant? Why do these students need this instruction right now? And then how does it impact student learning? So as you're doing your writing, you're going to put, want to put what you've done and you're going to want to tell them, but you have to be able to make sure that you're showing why, it, why is it important and how does it impact the students? Because the impact on student learning is the, the end goal. That is what we're here for. That's what the whole process is about. And so we really have to show that most of all when we're doing our writing. Um, All right. So um, as we were okay, talking earlier, really ask, oh, and this kind of goes in, so, uh, she just asked, do you recommend using bolded or underlined keywords and responses to help them find a language? And that kind of goes into what you're saying with the scoring, but also with the writing. Um, I do know people who have bolded words um, whose coaches have told them to do that. I did not do that because I did not have room. Like, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm very wordy. So space was at a premium. Um, and you can't go over those page numbers. So, and, and of course also in, make sure you read your instructions. I, I made a blender with this with my very first one that I was working on. Um, I single spaced it and it had to be double spaced. So I had like 12 pages that were single spaced and I had to go cut about half of it. Wow. So, that's huge. <laughs> read your I bet that was hard. <laughs> oh my gosh. I cried. I bet. Bless your heart. I, I had... I had bolded some of mine at first, but then um, when I was trying to find page room, I unfolded and got the page room. And Dr. Shields made a good point in a session yesterday. And one of my mentors also said that, think of your prompts as your topic sentence. Yes. And that will help the assessors um, kind of pinpoint on it. And once I started doing that, it, it helped me a lot with my wording. Yeah. Absolutely. I could not use any underlining or bolding, um, but I did just like Tina just said. I mean, I looked at the question, what is the question I'm answering? And I would reword it into my answer. Um, and so that's how I did it. And I had, you're going to have so many people read over this, hopefully. 
um, so that they are able to see, okay, yes, I see your questions. And if not helping you reword it, and we'll kind of talk about um, those mentors and things like that in just a little bit. But um, yes, it's very important to make sure that they can find it. Um, but I guess it's really just your preference, what you, how you think that it's best. Um, and like I said, I, I know that I had people who read mine who suggested doing that, um, but I, I did not have space. Yeah. With, you know, holding, and, you know, it's amazing how much, how much space that can take up. Yeah. So especially when you're just kind of scrounging to like get that like extra two words on the page or something. So uh -huh. I, I don't think that it's necessary. I did, I did not include that in any of my final, um, my final submissions. Yeah, neither did I. All right, so here is um, the scoring guide. So once you have turned in your components, um, to me was the worst part of the whole process, um, is the waiting part. So you will turn in, um, in, is it May? I forget. Yes. Yes. So in May, you will start submitting um, your components or you will have your components submitted and there's a deadline for you to have it submitted. Um, and then you will not hear anything for months. So during this time, it is a very, very long process. And that's why it takes so long is because we have people that go out and sit and read all of these components, looking to make sure that all of the pieces are there. Where is the evidence? Did they answer all of the prompts, all of this type of thing? And they go through and they grade them, um, so that takes, it takes a while, um, but everybody gets their scores released at the same time. So that would be in December. It's usually the, the beginning of December, they have a score release. And so that's when you get your scores and you were able to kind of see, um, how did I do? Is it something that, am I okay with that score? Or is it something that I might need to look at redoing? Um, but you're going to want to make sure that um, before you do that, and we're going to look in just a second, I think it's the next slide, um, is looking at the, the rubric for that grading. And so, let's see, I'm going to skip to the rubric and then I'll go back. Um, so each one in your um, component instructions, each one of them has a rubric. So there's going to be level four, three, two, and one in your rubrics. Um, so as you are going through and you're working on your components, looking at the level four rubric is the most important. So that is the things, okay, so if I have all of this stuff, that means I'm going to make a perfect score and making sure that as you're going through and you're working on that, that you do meet every single one of these and that you're very clear, concise, and convincing on each one of these different uh, pieces of that rubric. Um, when you go through, you'll see there's, you know, also a, ru a rubric for levels three, two, and one, but we don't really want to look there. We want to shoot high. So always looking at that level four rubric to see, do I have all of these things in? So hopefully I can get that highest score. Um, so going back, so this is what um, you are going to have. So here's the four different levels. So level four, like I said, is the highest. That's going to be the score range between 3.75 and 4.25, which is the highest that you can score. So if you have a level four, level three, then you are doing awesome. Very good. Um, but each one of the different areas, each component, you can only have a minimum of 1.75. If you score anything below 1.75, then you have to go and redo that component. So if, um, if I got component two back with a 1.72, I would have to redo that whole component over again within that five-year limit um, because that is the minimum. You can't go below that. But you have to really score higher than that because at the end, you have to have a total of 110 points. Um, but like we talked about how they're weighted differently. Um, so really paying attention to that. And here's the scoring calculator that we were talking about earlier. So there's a link here to the scoring calculator. So you click on it. And once you get those scores, back, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I just, that the scoring calculator is in the chat also. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so once you go into that scoring calculator and in December, when you get those test scores back, you can plug in. Okay. So on component one, this is what I scored component three. This is what I scored. And then it tells you, okay, so this is how many points you have left. So you need to score this or this on the next components. Um, and it, it is very, very um, tempting to go in there very often to say, well, what if I did this and take off like a tenth of a point, you know, keep going down uh, to see what is the lowest I can make. Don't do that. Just score, just aim for that level four rubric. That's what we want to do. One thing right. too, I don't think we mentioned this on component one, but on component one, because there's the selective response, which is just like multiple choice, and there's like 45 questions on your content, but then you, when you have those three um, constructive response questions, if you score low on just one part of that, you can retake that part of component one. You do not have to retake the entire test. So when you go to the score calculator, it's going to ask you if you've already taken component one what you made on each section. And when you plug that in, like you'll know like, okay, if you didn't do as well on one of the, the constructive responses, you can go back and re-register for component one and only take that part and you can bank the rest of your scores. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Yes. All right, so um, just a little information on some reasons that candidates do not earn a certifying score. Um, one of the main things is gonna be that all of the prompts weren't answered. So that's why we've said over and over, it's important to go through those instructions, go through that rubric, go through all of those things and make sure that you have answered every one of the prompts. Um, like JC said earlier, typing all those questions out and then making sure that each one of those questions has been answered. Um, so making sure that you don't leave anything out on those prompts. Um, it could be that in your instructional goals were not clear. So that goes back to that clear, convincing, concise, making sure that we know what our goal is and that we express it and show how we're working towards it. Um, did we make the goal? Did we not? And this is what I'm going to do to follow up. Um, highlighted assignments do not show growth over time. So that's going to go back to your um, component two. So that's where you have the work sample. So you collect work samples from the beginning of a lesson and the end of a lesson. And as an accomplished teacher, we want to have growth. We want to see that our students are succeeding. And so if you're submitting work samples and there's no growth and no change, then that's an area we need to say, okay, this is not um, working for my students. I need to go back next time and I need to work on this. I need to do this. How are you going to change things up? Um, and then the evidence and artifacts are um, not going to be clear, clear, convincing, and concise. The evidence is not showing everything that um, was in that component, or it's not enough evidence. And then just not giving enough feedback. So just like we said earlier, whenever you are... Um, talking about your students in that written commentary. So say that you have videoed yourself and in that video, you have a student who's not paying attention or they're rolling around on the floor or they're eating their shoestring, you know, things that we see every day. What are you going to do? How are you going to help that child? So it's okay to have those things, but we have to make sure that we have a plan and we state the plan of what we're going to do to help each one of our children succeed always being equitable. Um, and you'll see at the bottom of a lot of these slides, there is the source of uh, Bobby Faulkner. And one of my high recommendations and that I used um, very, very often throughout the whole process was to get her books. She has several books um, and it goes through the components. It talks about the language to use. It's very clear. It's very it's very easy to understand. Um, they're quick reads, they're thin books, but I used them all the time and they really, really helped me. All right, so to kind of tie up what we've just talked about, all four components, you have three years from the time that you sign up, you'll have three years to try every four, each one of the four components. Um, you can submit all four in one year, or you can take the whole three years. Um, just what are you able to do at that time? What are you um, feel comfortable with? 
but you, um, even though you can do them in any order, you do have to complete all of them within five years. So these are the things that just that you want to keep in mind. Um, and then whatever, whenever you go to register for national boards, it's going to ask you which components are you working on this, this school year. And so whichever components that you choose, those are the ones that you have to submit within that cycle. Um, I know that you have a certain drop period, I believe, but um, it's very important to make sure that you keep all of that, whatever you've signed up to do, that you are ready to submit those when the time is there. Um, I'll add to that, especially if you are a state scholarship recipient, uh, the state will, you know, your scholarship pays for you to attempt each component one time. So you know, when you register and you've decided like, okay, this year I'm going to do components one and two or three and four or however you, you know, whichever ones you're going to do, when you go there and you register for that one and you go ahead and submit that one or you, you know, have kind of finalized it, then uh, if you don't submit it and you haven't like gone in during that grace period and withdrawn your intent, then that's your attempt. So if you don't submit anything, but you didn't, you know, go in and make the changes during that allotted time, then the state is not going to pay for you to do it again. They only pay for one attempt. So, and I think it's about $450. Is mm -hmm. that right? For each, each attempt. So, um, you know, keep that in mind if you do have the state scholarship, but you can do it in any order that you want, but, um, but you have to submit, if you have registered for it, you have to submit something for them to score. Um, right. There was a question about when to pay, especially if you have the state scholarship, um, they will tell you when to pay, but wait until February. Cause that way, I mean, if you're working on it and life happens, you're trying to do two components, life happens and you realize, okay, I am not going to be ready with one of those components then you're not out of any money. I waited literally to the day before the deadline to um, submit my payment. Yeah, me too. I did too. <laughs> yeah. You never know what's going to happen. So better safe than sorry. Um, but yes, so here's just the information. So whenever you have chosen which area that you're going to focus on, you feel very confident with that area. Um, and you have really gone through the components, you've looked at the standards, and you were sure that's what you want to do, then you are going to follow the website, you will um, register online, and there is a $75 registration fee that you have to pay each year. So if you complete all four components in one year, you'll only have to pay $75 once. But if you spread it out across two or three years, then you'll, each year you'll have to do that $75 fee. Um, dollars also is not covered by your state scholarship. No. So whether you have a scholarship or not, you are responsible for paying the $75. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then when you do register, it's going to ask you um, which components that you want to work on. You'll go ahead and click on those components and then you can pay then or it can be paid later or if the scholarship's paying, then it'll pay that way. Um, but it's going to ask you which components. So be prepared to choose when you register, which components you are going to submit. And then, of course, you're just reading. You're reading all of those standards, all of the instructions, all the components, um, and have just a really good plan of attack. Um, there are so much help out there. Um, I didn't know when I first started. Uh, like I said, I just kind of jumped in. I saw um, scholarship, and I was like, I want to do that. And so I applied for it, got it had no idea that there was help out there. So please um, reach out to your in-service centers. Those are probably going to be the best help for getting you with someone who can really help you. Um, it's going to give you that support that you need. It's going to give you mentors to help read through your work, look at your videos, look at your work samples, give you feedback. Um, but it's also going to give you that accountability of, okay, I haven't started yet. I need to start. This person's going to be expecting me to have this for them to look at that type of thing. Um, so really just get that support. You do not have to do it alone. There's so many of us out here that are willing to help you, to mentor you. Um, and so please reach out. 
Um, and this can be, there's different, depending on the school district you're at or county you're working in. Um, some counties have their own cohorts, some schools. Um, I went through my regional in-service center um, and they were phenomenal. They have helped me every step of the way. Um, so really just reaching out and seeing where can I get help because it will be very beneficial through this whole process. Let me add to that to you. Um, if you happen to be somewhere where you are not near an in-service center, um, like I said, I teach in Coleman County. My in-service center is at Athens State, which is a good hour, hour and a half sometimes away. And um, they also even had some meetings that were closer to me because there were other teachers in Coleman who were interested in the process. So they had some meetings that were close to Coleman. Reach out to them and tell them where you are and what you want to do. And you know, they're, they're going to try to help you. Also, if you can't find a local cohort, like if everybody at your school just thinks that you're insane for starting this process, there are lots of uh, available like support groups online. And Bobby Faulkner that we talked about that she has written several of those books, she admins some Facebook groups for teachers who are going through that process. And so I know that I'm in a couple of those. Uh, even if you hate Facebook and you hate social media and you don't want to use it for anything else, if you go on there and, and search for NBCT and there are even groups like for your certificate area. So like there's a group that's um, EMC literacy, which is what I did. And, you know, I went on there, there are lots of people asking questions all the time. There are people who have been through the process who answer questions. Bobby is there and she will come in and give advice and, and talk about specific things. So that's, that's a great resource. Um, so I highly recommend going and doing that. And then of course, I mean, you know, there are lots of other online support groups that you can find through, you know, just, you know, just Googling it. But, um, but that was a really good source of support for me when I didn't have someone who was going through my exact certificate area to be able to go on there and ask um, some, some teachers who were doing that or who had just recently gone through it. And I put the link up to um, the, the boot camp website because at the bottom of it are the links to the Alabama Network Facebook groups that we created. So I helped do the um, generalist and we're there to answer questions and support. Awesome. Thank you, guys. But yes, I second the, um, the Facebook groups. They are wonderful. Um, I know as I was going through the writing process, and you'll see that it's getting very close, like within those last two months before it's time to submit, people will be asking every question. And you're thinking, I needed to know this. And so you go back to your paper and you're like, did I do that? So that is very helpful is having those people because they're going to be asking those questions that you need to know and even questions you didn't know you had. Um, so it's always very helpful to have that support. So yes, that's perfect. I did tons of keyword searches. If I got stuck, I would go to those Facebook groups and just yeah. kind of keyword search and then it would show me comments and questions about what I was looking for and it was helping someone had a question too about um are there specific examples you're not going to find examples of what it looks like um for you to do I made mistake when I first started I was like all over internet going okay I need to see an example of this writing I need to see an example of the commentary that someone's done and it is not there it's not supposed to be there this is your teaching but Atlas is really um, great for kind of getting a feel for that with at least looking at some of the videos for component three. Yes, um, Atlas, I went in and it helped me to see because you'll see there's videos and all of these are for people who have certified um, in the Atlas website. And so once you go in there and you start looking at the videos, you see that it's not perfect classrooms. So that made me feel better about my teaching. So I was like, okay, so it's really, it's really, you know, real life. Um, but then they also have um, the teachers had submitted. Now this is going to um, the way that it used to be. It's not, things have kind of changed since the Atlas, um, but it gives you that you kind of see how they've worded things. And it gives you ideas of the way that the, the vocabulary that you're supposed to use, how the questions are answered, things like that. So while it's not gonna be, something you can exactly use, it's gonna be very beneficial to go through Atlas and look in, at those writing samples, look at those, um, the different components that they submitted, the work samples, all of that, that will be helpful for you. 
All right. So once you certify, hopefully all three, all of you guys will certify within three years and you will be um, at our national board network conference, which comes up is in, is it January of every year? I believe it's still going to be in January this year. Yes. So it is a conference that we have every year and it's where we have all of our new NBCTs come and we celebrate um, it's for anyone though, if you want to come, then you just keep up with the web, the Facebook group and they will be posting it within the next uh, three, four months. I'll probably start advertising, but it is just a wonderful wealth of knowledge. Um, it has a lot of sessions just like this one. Um, it has sessions on each one of the components. You can go, you can ask questions. Um, there's mentors there. There's so many things there to help you. So we highly suggest going to that conference each year. Uh, Marie, I see your question about the date and location. I'm not sure that that's been determined yet, the exact date. So as soon as that has been determined, then that will be posted up on the Facebook group and probably yes. on the website also. Yes, definitely follow the Facebook group. Um, it's, it's very heavily advertised on there. So if you're following that, you will not miss it. We promise. All right. So um, this is, oh, we're going to skip that. If you want to see um, this old, I'm sorry. If you want to see the deadlines, um, it's that link that we shared earlier. Like we said, where you scroll down to the bottom, it shows you all the deadlines, when you need to register by, when the components would be due, to, due by, and all of that information. All right, and so the goal for all of us, the reason we're all here is to get that wonderful email in December showing your fireworks saying congratulations, you are a National Board Certified Teacher, um, which is a super huge honor. Um, and we know you guys, just because you're here, you're interested, we know that you guys are capable of it. And we are here to help you every step of the way. Um, here are our names, our emails. If you want to email, I'm sure JC won't mind. I don't mind um, taking our email addresses. If you have questions throughout the year, anything like that, um, we don't mind answering those questions. Um, and just like Tina said earlier, those um, links that she posted with the in-service centers and all of that, definitely get in touch with them as well. And if you did not get the email from Dr. Shields with your access to um, Atlas, uh, you can contact your in-service center and they will also provide you access. Yeah. Check your uh, maybe junk mail because it won't come in from Dr. Shields. It comes in as Atlas because what she did in a session we were in was she created a group for all of us and started put it's called had to go through with all cutting and pasting all the emails and getting commas in and um it was an adventure but getting all that so but then it comes straight from atlas once she gives you the invite for it also make sure i put the website um, um bulletin board go ahead and put comments suggestions um because some of the sessions we've added this year were um, sessions from comments that were made from last year's boot camp of things that we could add or things that we could change. So go ahead and make those suggestions so that it helps grow our boot camp. All right, does anyone have any questions that they are curious about they would like to know? Anything you can think of, Will. Thank you, Thank you, chat. We're good. We're caught up. Hello. Yes. Yes. I've been posting in the thing earlier, the first beginning of the session. You guys said it's about attendance, but I have not seen a link to where we could okay. sign and say you attended. I'll put another one. I've put it up several times, but um, I'll put it up there again. Let me cut and paste it. Okay. All right, just a reminder. Um, so once you have um, kind of gone through and you're trying to think of which components, remember all of these um, that were, all of these from this conference have been recorded. Most of them are recorded. So you can go through and you can look and say, okay, I want to think I want to do component two. You can go back and watch the video of the, um, of the session for that component. And it can kind of answer your questions give you information, that type of thing. So those are there for you to use as well. 
There was a question about um, how much time did you spend writing? And it's just gonna depend. Um, like I blocked out when I first started, you know, I kept up all my evidence and I planned and stuff. And then I kind of blocked out maybe an hour or so when I got home a couple nights a week, especially like I think usually about Thursday because I had a lot of stuff. But the over Christmas break, I blocked out more time after Christmas break was when I started really heavy. And basically I took over um, what we call at our house, the computer room. It's really my husband's man cave. I took over it for about three hours every Saturday morning, closed the door and locked everybody out and typed. When it got down to the last few weeks, I took more time <laughs> to do it. And I was doing some more nights of, of just writing and editing. But it just depends on your situation. A, a lot of people took Thanksgiving break and planned to write for that whole break, Christmas break, stuff like that. It just depends. And most importantly, just start early, um, especially with the, the collection of your work samples, um, your videoing, whatever component you're working on. Um, that's kind of where, so for August, September, October, that's really just what I did. Mm -hmm. I collected every work sample from every kid because I didn't know who I was going to use. Mm -hmm. um, I recorded lots of different lessons, whole group, small group, um, just lots of, lots of work samples, lots of evidence. Um, so that way, once in kind of like she said, around Christmas break is when I really sat down and I started looking through the work samples. Okay, so I think this is what I'm going to use. These are the students I'm going to use because you only choose a couple of students um, work samples or these are the videos that I think I'm going to go with. Um, so really just starting early with collecting those work samples, those videos and all of that. Um, and if you're on component four, really looking at um the different things that you're doing throughout the year, like with professional development and assessment and all that. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, around Christmas break, when I had that nice long break, that's really when I started working on the writing portion of it. So I'd already read all the standards. I'd read what I was supposed to do. I had the evidence, the work samples and things in front of me, and then I could really start then. And definitely keep evidence of everything. Even if I was sending stuff home, I took tons and tons of pictures of stuff yeah. before I would send it home. Um, when I narrowed down, I had to have two children um, to focus on for component two. I had narrowed down to the two I wanted, but I had four children that I was collecting. Well, in the middle of my writing, one child moved away. I was like, oh my God, I'm glad I've got a backup. Yes. The other child I was, was not writing about, all of a sudden, the light bulb turned on, and she started doing such incredible work. I had I switched her over and just erased all the writing I had done on one of the other children to start writing about her, because mm -hmm. just, you know, just such an incredible growth that I could highlight. So have plenty of evidence. Also, when I was writing, I would go back, and I was writing up evidence, and realized, Oh my God, I, I don't have any evidence to show. So um, keep everything. Everything. Yes, everything. <laughs> Another thing I did, and this is a little different, I guess, because of being in secondary instead of elementary, but at the beginning of the year, I survey my students and, you know, I ask them questions about themselves. I mean, not, you know, really nosy questions, but just, you know, things that they could tell me. And uh, that really helped with the getting to know my students. And I also, um, asked, you know, I talked to parents and I asked, you know, surveyed parents so that all of that information I could use into, you know, it, you know, giving good examples of like how I knew my students. So, um, you know, right at the beginning of the year is a really great time to do that and, you know, and kind of gather up some evidence about like your students. For, my, for me doing uh, literacy, like knowing kind of what their attitudes were about reading and I could show like graphs and things. I, I just used a Google form about, you know, the number of students who said that they read on a regular basis for pleasure or the ones who said they never read, um, you know, how comfortable they felt with reading and writing and that sort of thing. So, you know, just starting off the year like that, it gave me a lot of insight anyway, just for my students, but then it was really helpful also with uh, national boards. 
There was a question about the signing in. Um, once you sign in for the day, you're you're good for the rest of the day because you'll click what sessions you plan to attend or there's also a box if you weren't going to attend a session um, during that component time or component, I'm thinking national boards <laughs> during that time frame. Um, so just do that link one time and you're good for the rest of the day. And then I see Hannah has a question. Did any of us do all four in a year? Um, I did not. I did two, I did two and then the next two. Um, the teacher next door to me did do all four in a year. Um, I know a lot of people that, that have done all four in a year. It just depends on how much time that you have outside, I think, of the classroom to <laughs> to work on it and, and write and yeah. everything. So, yeah. One of the... the teacher colleagues that she and I did at the same time and she decided to do all four one year while I was breaking it down and I I spent the whole year telling her you were crazy right after she submitted she found out she was pregnant and then I was like oh, wow. okay you were you are not crazy <laughs> she, she knew she wouldn't have been able to do it once she realized she was pregnant so I'm so glad I did that so it just kind of depends on your personality and what you think you can do and handle mm -hmm. Anybody else have questions? Well, if you think of any, <laughs> go for <laughs> contact us or, um, or anyone else here, your um, in-service center, uh, Dr. Shields, I, you know, there's, there's so much help out there. Uh, the guidelines for each component. Um, if you go to the national board site, mbpts.org, um, you can um, scroll down there and choose the component, go to choose your component, and then there's a drop down list, and then you choose your component, and that will give you uh, the guidelines for that one. You can see everything about that component. And then there's the, um, I'm putting the link up here again for the bulletin board, so that you can check it out and add stuff on there too, if you uh, need anything on that. I think there was a question too about the stipends, um, and the yeah. link got up on there too, on it. I know they're really working hard to try to increase and add more right now. It's just kind of specific. Uh, I think a big part right now is they're trying to help encourage uh, more teachers to stay or to come into the, the sciences and the math fields because they're so hard to, um, mm -hmm. you know, feel right now. But um, as they can get more money allocated, um, they're, they're hoping to add more because we would all, especially if we're in the early childhood and, and some of those literacy categories, but we're not at a Title I school or 100% free and reduced lunch, because my school just went to Title One, so yes, <laughs> whole district is Title One, but um, none of the schools right now qualify because they're not at that seventy-five percent yeah. rate. That's the way ours are as well. So it has to be above seventy-five percent. So um, when you apply, um, so whenever you go on to register, you are going to have to automatically pay that seventy-five dollar registration fee. Um, that'll cover you for the year. And then you have an option to pay for your component right then, or you can pay at a later date. Um, they ha and they tell you what the date is that you have to be, have to have it paid by. But I think it's, it's that February date. Yeah. Okay. You have to have everything done. It's close to the end of February. Yes. But you do have to pay that $75 the yes. second you register. Yeah, that one is right away. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.